bless your life. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, as we enter into the preaching of the word. Now, we, we hear this verse, or this chapter rather, read many times around the Christmas season, but it was time of year to reflect on the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the scripture says, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 22 verse 1, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. Ecclesiastes 7.1 echoes that thought in saying a good name is better than precious ointment. A name is not just your identity, it also defines in some cases who you are. I'd like to title this message tonight, A Name You Can Call On. A Name You Can Call On. There are names that have shaped history. I could talk about philosophers like Plato and Aristotle and Confucius and Voltaire. Names that actually changed the way that people perceive things. World leaders like Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Napoleon Bonaparte, Joan of Arc, William the Conqueror. Each of these names bring you to a certain place in history. When we look at the founding of our own great nation, we think of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, Abraham Lincoln, men who blazed a great trail of democracy. And even in this day and time, we think about great presidents and leaders of the world like Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. If you would turn the page with me to the religious world, you would think of names like Martin Luther, who was the father of Protestantism, John Wesley and Matthew Henry and Jonathan Edwards, the great evangelist, Charles Finney and John Lake, and then the more contemporaries to us who would be in the Pentecostal realm, we reflect on Smith Wigglesworth and Donald G. and Charles S. Price. When I hear these names, I just get a mental image of people who walk with God. Names that invoke a specific opinion or an idea when their names are mentioned. If I were to talk about Rockefeller, you would think about money. Names like Rothschild or Vanderbilt, you'd think about high finance. If I were to call the name Henry Ford or Thomas Edison or Alexander Graham Bell, you would think about folks who were talented in manufacturing and developing new ideas. So names are very important. When I think about my own family that God has blessed me to be born into, I, I can tell you that I am godly proud of the name Minnick. My grandfather helps add to my pride in the fact that he was a godly man. Even though he only had a third grade education, the Lord chose to use him. He was born again and baptized in the Holy Ghost in 1925. In fact, after his spirit baptism, he went around for three days speaking in tongues, could not speak in English. In fact, one afternoon my grandmother sent him out behind the house where she had just planted a little garden and she wanted him to go out and hoe the weeds. So he got out there hoeing the weeds and got to thinking about how good God was to him and how he took him out of a life of being a bootlegger and called him into the ministry and blessed him with the baptism of the Holy Ghost and he got to shouting and stomped all my grandma's plants down. (laughs) 
But he was called to preach in 1930. His first preaching opportunities were in the black churches in eastern Arkansas. He was credentialed with the Assemblies of God in 1938. He pioneered a church in Mariana, Arkansas in 1939 that he started in an old livery stable in a six-week revival where he baptized 67 of those converts. Then many of the other churches in the surrounding area would call him in those days to come and preach about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That was one of his favorite subjects to preach on. None of his sons or daughters were called into ministry as pulpiteers or preachers, but I have two other cousins beside myself in the family who were blessed with the call to preach. My cousin Tony Minnick was the first of the grandsons to enter into ministry in 1966. He started as an evan uh, evangelist in the Little Rock, Arkansas area and remained bivocational for the first couple of years uh, in ministry. He was, a, he was a salesman for a company called Dual Fast Staples. And uh, they had a certain kind of staple and staple gun that was useful uh, in some uh, heavy-duty applications. So they assigned him a van full of staples and staple guns, and he would go from place to place and try to sell his wares. Well, while at the same time studying for ministry and wanting to be anointed to be a great Holy Ghost-filled preacher, back in those days, he rigged him up an old eight-track player in his van. And he went and bought him one of those recorders that would record eight tracks. And he took the recordings of Alexander Scorby reading the Bible. And he would record an eight track tape filled with scripture. While he was going from appointment to appointment, he'd plug it in and he would memorize entire chapters of the Bible. <laughs> well, you can guess what frame of mind he was in when he got to his next appointment. He wasn't ready to sell staples. He was ready to preach the gospel. Amen. So finally, his employer thought it was better for him to go ahead and enter into full-time ministry. And he did so and uh, ended up pioneering a church in, in uh, Jackson, Tennessee. And after that, he pastored in Muldrow, Oklahoma, and in Milan, Tennessee, as well as he is currently pastoring the church that Sherry and I planted in Little Rock. My dad vocationally was a truck driver, but God blessed him with the ability to write songs, and, and many of, of the great gospel groups that you've heard of uh, have recorded my dad's songs. My aunts and uncles helped pioneer churches. They served as deacons and Sunday school teachers. They gave of their resources to the church. They lived the gospel in front of their peers. They established a reputation as being prayer warriors. And they maintained a standard of godly living throughout the year. So that's the reason that I am godly proud of my name. But for almost 30 years, God blessed me with a long-term relationship with the Happy Goodmans. They have truly blessed my life. And what you saw on television or on the stage was who they really were. They love God. They, they love to pray and they love to read the Word and they love to talk about God and love to preach and to sing. The last few years, we've been associated with another name that has been a great blessing that I'm proud of, and, and that's the name Gaither. Uh, Bill Gaither has been responsible for a resurrection of gospel music, and uh, now gospel music is being sung around the world, and, and there's not too many places in the world that hadn't heard of uh, the Gaither homecoming or... Another name that I've been associated with throughout my entire ministry has been the Assemblies of God and uh, a, a very close cousin to the Church of God. But I, I want to tell you tonight, even though that I'm proud of the names that I've been associated with, the fact is the name Minnick didn't save me. 
And the name Happy Goodman didn't save me. And the, and the name Gaither didn't save me. And the name Assemblies of God didn't save me. There's, there's, only, there's only one name high enough for that. There's only one name given among men whereby we must be saved. That name, my friend, is not Buddha, and it's not Muhammad, and it's not Krishna, and it's not Rama, and it's not Zoroaster, but it's the name that Isaiah is talking about when we read the scripture earlier. In fact, the angel Gabriel told Mary in Luke chapter 1, verse 30, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. And he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Hallelujah. Praise God. My, my friend Bill Gaither said it well in one of his songs when he wrote, there's something about that name. Can you say amen? amen? And the Heavenly Father knew that we needed a powerful name to call on in time of trouble. I look at Acts chapter 4 verse 12 where it says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name given among men whereby we must be saved. In fact, Philippians chapter 2 verse 9 tells us, Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, things in heaven and things of earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, the fact is we as human beings need a name we can call on from time to time. If I might remind you of Isaiah 9, 6, where it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And I'm just going to use those names to talk to you just for a few moments tonight. When you call on him the very first time, you soon learn why. The first thing Isaiah called him was wonderful. <laughs> now, I know we use that word loosely very often. We talk about having a wonderful time or this has been a wonderful day or we've taken advantage of a wonderful situation or that is a wonderful person. But Isaiah is saying that we'd be wise to reserve the use of this word for one who is truly deserving of its meaning. And when I stop to think of what he has done for me, it's amazing. Hallelujah. It's glorious. It's incomprehensible. It is truly wonderful what Jesus has done. I believe we all had the same testimony. The Bible said we were all dead in trespasses and sin. We were all on our way to a devil's hell. Weren't fit to live and afraid to die. But we heard a voice, hallelujah, and that was the voice of Jesus saying, come unto me and rest, lie down thy weary one, lay down, hallelujah, and we did so, we laid our head upon his breast, and we found in him a resting place, and he has made us glad, that's why there's joy in our singing, that's why there's joy in our shouting, that's why there's joy in our preaching, that's why there's joy in our our conversation because someone who is truly wonderful has turned us around. Us, we all who were headed for hell are now headed in a new direction. We've changed because of that wonderful mercy of Jesus Christ. I can agree with a songwriter that says he's more wonderful than my mind can conceive. He's more wonderful than my heart can believe. He goes beyond my highest hopes and fondest dreams. He is everything that my soul longed for. Everything he's promised and so much more. He 
he's more than amazing. He's more than marvelous. He's more than miraculous could ever be because he's more wonderful. That's what Jesus means to me. Can you shout amen with me tonight? <laughs> Isaiah testified, he said, for behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sin behind thy back. For the grave cannot praise thee, and death cannot celebrate thee, and they that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. It's the living, the living, hallelujah. Let me add to it, everyone in this building tonight that's breathing in and breathing out air, we're the ones that have the privilege and the duty to celebrate the wonderful Jesus Jesus Christ, who poured out mercy and grace upon our life. Thank God for salvation. Thank God for the freedom that we have in him. Hallelujah. Isaiah said he was the counselor. Now, even though I'm thankful to be saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost, just like you, Satan tries to impede my progress. He does it with situations and circumstances, and at times my mind gets confused. Am I alone? That's when I need a counselor. Someone who knows where I've been. Someone who knows the tricks of the devil. Someone who knows the road I'm traveling. Someone I can just sit down and talk to. Another word for a counselor is the word attorney. Sometimes I find myself in some trouble that I didn't mean to get into. Sometimes I've allowed my flesh to get me into something that I can't get out of by myself. Sometimes I've done things that I know has offended the heart of the Heavenly Father and I just need to do like the old song says, just have a little talk with Jesus and get everything straightened out. If you're in that shape right now, I want you to listen to the words of John, what he had to say in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. He said, my little children, these things I write unto you that ye sin not. How many know that's God's will that ye sin not? And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation or the covering for our sin. And not for ours only, but also for the sin of the whole world. I can just hear that one who is seated at the right hand of the Father who is making intercession for me. I can hear his words as he sends them earthbound to my ear. He's saying, I have got you covered. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that he's got you covered tonight? Isaiah called him the mighty God. The mighty God. Now folks, we know that there's a lot of pagan worship in this world today. There are books and books that you can read about man's search for God. And all the mistakes that he made in choosing false gods. There are books that you can go to the library and read about the Egyptian gods, including the Book of the Dead, the writings of Zoroaster, the Hindu scriptures, the scriptures of Buddha, who really didn't write anything others wrote for him. Now, it'd be easy for me to spend a couple of weeks behind this pulpit making the case, if anyone would stay and listen, and reveal these pagan religions that are about as divine as a fence post. The Apostle Paul talks about it and doesn't have a kind word to say. He shows in the scripture how a man who had the opportunity to know God chose not to acknowledge him as God and continued to lower his sight and his expectation of who God was so that he could bring down a God that was on his own level. In the book of Romans, it explains quite vividly where a man was and what he become. 
It says in the first chapter of the book of Romans, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise. They became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like into corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped the creature more than the creator. So we see the picture here clearly how down they went from God to man and from man to bird and from bird to beast and from beast to creeping things. Man's terrible trip downward in worship brought him to a place where he ended up worshiping gods made out of wood and gods that were made out of stone and idols of gold and silver that can't see and gods that can't hear and gods that can't feel and gods that cannot answer a prayer or walk with you in the valley or help you you over the mountain or bear your burden. Gods that will never be able to share your burden or your yoke or comfort you when you're in pain. I'm talking about false gods who cannot heal you when you're sick or deliver you when you're in trouble or clothe you when you're naked or feed you when you're hungry. Gods that will never find you in fiery furnaces or deliver you from lion's dens. Gods that will never be able to fight your battles or help you gods that cannot fill you when you're empty or brush the tears from your eyes God that can't pick you up when you've fallen or carry you when you're too weak to go or cannot lead you like a shepherd a God that'll never feed you the bread of life or write your name in the Lamb's book of life or redeem you with his own blood or pay redemption price or will come again and take you to an eternal home Zoroaster can't do it Muhammad can't do it Buddha can't do it God himself declares himself to be the one and only true God and he has proved himself to be God throughout the ages hallelujah <laughs> David said the heavens of heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament show his handiwork no means of measure can define his limitless love. Hallelujah. No far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of the shore of his supply. No barriers can hinder him from pouring out his blessing. You see, he is enduringly strong. He is entirely sincere. He is eternally steadfast. He is immortally graceful. He is imperially powerful. He is all always been and he always will be. He had no predecessor and he'll have no successor. There's nobody like him and there'll be nobody after him. You can't impeach him and he's not going to resign. How many will join me in saying for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> glory to God. Isaiah said he was the everlasting father. Oh, we live in an ever-changing world. If you don't believe that, just pay attention the next time you look in the mirror. It's difficult at best to have confidence in anything because you know it's bound to change. But there's one that you never have to worry about changing. And you can put your confidence in him. Hallelujah. What he was yesterday, he still is today. What he is today, he'll be tomorrow. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Before the mountains were formed, he is. Before the sun ever saw its first morning, he is. Before there was a heaven to dwell in, before there was a cherubim or a seraphim, before there was a when or a where, a then or a there, 
He is from everlasting to everlasting. That's my God tonight. He is the one that will supply all of my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. In Deuteronomy, the scripture says, there is none like the God of Jeserin who rides the heavens to help you and on the clouds in his majesty. The eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms and he will drive out your enemy before you saying destroy him. Oh I'm reminded of the old hymn that we used to sing nearly every Sunday morning. What have I to dread and what have I to fear? I'm leaning on the everlasting arm. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. I'm leaning on the everlasting arm. I'm leaning safe and secure from all alarm. I'm leaning on the everlasting arm. If you're glad to be leaning upon him tonight, just wave at me and shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Isaiah had another wonderful name. He called him the Prince of Peace. Now we're in a very precarious place in history. In God's timetable, the scripture informs us that there will be rumors of wars and wars. That we're in perilous times. From time to time, world leaders gather together in Geneva for what they call a peace conference. We're really due one now. Our Secretary of State's trying to broker a peace deal between the Russians and Ukraine. He's trying to broker at the same time a peace deal between the Palestinians and Israel. And at the same time he's working on something with Iran and Iraq and the Sunnis and Shiites. And there are wars and rumors of wars as a sign of the soon appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we know people have tried and their efforts have gone forth. Hillary tried the reset button with Russia, but it didn't work. And Obama tried to hit the reset button with Syria and Egypt, but it failed. Different world leaders have attempted with best intentions to broker a peace deal, but to no avail because we are living in those perilous times that Paul was telling Timothy about. My friend, I'm here to tell you tonight there'll be no lasting peace on your job. There'll be no lasting peace in your home or in the church or in your neighborhood. There'll be no lasting peace in Alabama or Tennessee or in the U.S. or among the races or among the nations or even in religious circles. There'll be no peace until the Prince of Peace takes his place at the head of the table. And when he shows up, hallelujah, I said when he shows up, the peace speaker that told the wind and the waves to shut up and be quiet. I'm talking about the one who told the disciples who actually came to them walking on the water. The one who told two upset sisters who had a dead brother in the tomb that Lazarus would live again. I'm talking about the world, the one who can change chaos into order with one single word that will take the threat of a fire furnace and with his presence turn it in to a big fellowship meeting. Hallelujah. The one that will speak peace in the midst of the storm of every life in this building tonight. He said my peace I give to you. My peace I leave with you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There might be trouble all around but you have peace if you have Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, someone want to give him some praise tonight. Aren't you glad the peace speaker is here? Well, I think you get the idea of whatever name you need to call on. You can call it tonight. I'm glad he's the healer. I'm glad he's the deliverer. I'm glad he is the provider. 
I'm glad he is the one that will give us what we need when we need it. I'm glad that he's always on time. Hallelujah. I've been in his presence when he's touched those who could not help themselves. And I don't know how you're here tonight, what condition you've come in, but I, I want to give you I want to give you some courage tonight to know that whatever you need, there's a name that you can call on. Hallelujah. Earlier last year, the Lord blessed us to be able to preach a number of meetings in some Baptist churches. And they did not try to restrict anything that we preached. Of course, I, I respect every denomination's pulpit, and I wouldn't dare go in to sow confusion in any church. But the pastors and the church were hungry for a move of God, and, and uh, the presence of the Lord was so real. Phil and Lonnie were with me one particular night in Huntsville. We were in a... Uh, Baptist Church, it was, it was, I don't know that it was this large, it was a smaller place, but it was just totally jam-packed. And the Lord was moving, I, I think that night I was preaching on the blood of Jesus. You know, the blood of Jesus, hallelujah. And the Lord spoke to me and said, I'm, I'm going to have you pray for the sick tonight. And... Um, I believe that's going to happen tonight, Pastor, that we're going to pray for sick people tonight. That night, we had folks lined from wall to wall that we were praying for, and God was just, there were things that were happening instantly as we prayed. Now, now I know that God can heal any way that he wants to. You know, the scripture says, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Sometimes recover is not instantaneously. Sometimes recovery takes a period of time. But when you're sick, you'll take it any way you can get it. Amen. But God was just doing things instantly. And, and little to my knowledge, there was a little boy in the back. I wish I'd have brought his picture with me. He was, uh, at the time, I think he was six years old. He was not doing well in school because he had lost most of his hearing. I believe it was in his left ear. And uh, the doctors had examined him, and he had a big hole in his eardrum. And that was the reason that he had lost his hearing. And, and because of that, it made him very timid and shy. And he wouldn't look anyone in the eye while he was talking to him. He'd always be looking down. And he was suffering in his schoolwork because he couldn't pay enough attention, couldn't hear. And uh, it, it, like I said, it just made him shy. But... Somehow God moved on that little boy to have confidence that, that uh, he could get something from God. And there was a particular man in the congregation that he was very close to and he persuaded the man to bring him up to the front. In fact, he just carried him uh, nearly on his shoulder and brought him and set him down. And the piano was on this side, just like this piano. And there was a little area right here, just like there is tonight. And, and the man sat down, and he had the little boy cradled in his arm. And they were weeping and crying. And I walked over, and I had a prayer cloth with me, and I, I anointed that cloth with oil, and I, I prayed and, and asked the Lord to touch him and the little boy just wept and cried and he took the prayer cloth and, and uh, I really didn't hear much about what God did for him until a few days later. He was scheduled the next day for the doctor to go in and put tubes in his good ear so that they could drain the infection out. And at the same time, they were just going to take a look at the other ear to see if there's anything they could do about this hole in his eardrum. Well, they sent me pictures. He's sitting on the side of, of the bed in his little hospital gown, holding on to that prayer cloth with a big smile on his face, about to go in to this procedure. And he was going in, according to his grandma, believing that he had his healing. 
That's what he was believing. That's why he had a big smile on his face. So he went in. And the doctor came out just a few moments later and came to the waiting room where the mother and the grandmother were sitting. And he had a big smile on his face. And he said, you know, those tubes went in so easy and it's not going to be any problem to drain out this infection. But he said, what I can't understand is when I looked at the other ear, there's no hole there anymore. <laughs> He said there was something there about the size of a little pin that we just put a little patch on and the little boy came out saying, I can hear, I can hear. God restored his hearing. <laughs> Oh, that's not the end of it, folks. He, he uh, went back to school, and within six weeks, he was, he was on the principal's list for making straight A's in school. And he didn't look down to carry on a conversation with anybody. He looks them straight in the eye because he's got a testimony. What God has done for him, he called on the name that you can call on tonight. He called on the name of the healer. He called on the one that had the power to change his situation, to turn it around, to do something in his life that he could not do for himself. Oh, that's the Jesus I'm talking about tonight. Yes. Hallelujah. Would you pray with me as you stand?